Lord, thank you that you know how we work, how we run, what life is like for us, how we're free to be with you and to know you and with each other and the, the fellowship we have. We find out how much in common we have, how good you are in us, how good you are in our neighbors and the people around us, and what that life is like with you and how you work for our freedom. So we trust, we believe that you'll be doing that today in us again, through the word, by the spirit, you'll be doing life with us, which you think is the greatest idea ever, with us. So Open our hearts and our minds to hear what we might hear and see and know so that you'd be glorified and we built up and encouraged in Christ by the Spirit. In Jesus' name, everybody said, that's pretty good. Well done. True story. A boy named Andre Tolstik lived in a remote and unpopulated region of Siberia. And he was abandoned to that house and uh, a family dog when his, uh, by his mother and father before his first birthday. They were very remote, and they left him, up and left with the dog. Astonishingly, the boy survived, and for the next seven years... His only companion was the dog. When he was discovered by regional authorities, a a police spokesman said of him, when we approached, he was running about on all fours and growling. Andre faces years of difficult training in the use of speech. He didn't know a single word. How to use utensils. He used only his mouth to feed himself. How to accept and relate to people. He bit virtually everyone who got near him. How to use the bathroom, how and where to sleep, and everything else. Doctors' attempts with other children and psychologists and everybody you can imagine raised in similarly traumatic conditions provide little hope because they try to teach him human behavior, but it never seems to quite catch And the reason for that is an underlying problem that few have ever been able to overcome in that kind of a traumatic situation. It's a fundamental belief. Andre believes he is a dog and not a human. Even if he adopts the manners and customs of humans, he will do so only to survive and fit in and believe he's still a dog. Until he begins to believe what everybody around him knows... Andre is lost to himself. I believe something similar is true of many people in today's Christian community. They don't know who they are. They don't know what they have become. They don't know who they have in them. And so they act all too often in keeping with the world around them. While they've become the very best of this world through the new birth in Christ, having become wonderfully well-off sons of God, still they act lost. From seminars to sermons, from books to videos, we're increasingly, incessantly instructing each other on how to live right, the right way. Fathers should act kindly and kingly, and here's how. Mothers should be compassionate and capable, and here's how. Employees should be conscientious and diligent. Bosses, fair and insightful, and here's a book about that. And the reason? This is what they'll tell you, because God wants you to. That's why. That's how you can obey Him and please Him. But that's not really why. That's not the reason. We've been, all of us, raised in a captive world. But through Christ, we've been rescued and made actual sons and daughters of God himself through Jesus Christ. If we now attempt to act like him, while unaware we've actually been made like him, or if we adopt the manners and customs of Christ in order to survive and fit in, we'll be just like Andre, still off track lost to ourselves, even if we have the right look. 
From fathers and mothers to brothers and sisters to bosses and employees, we don't act the way we should because we don't know who we are. We don't know how to live the Christian life. But we're learning. That's the good news. We're learning. And the Apostle Paul, who wrote to the confused believers in the region of Galatia centuries ago about the Christian life, is teaching us too. They had the same problem. Raised captives, they'd now been set free by God, but they didn't know how to do it. This book of Galatians is a foundational book, a book of foundations so that we can believe and rest in what has happened for us and to us in the past so we can go forward in the future in Christ. We've seen that from Adam and Eve's exit from the Garden of Eden a long time ago, without life, that's what they left without. They had knowledge of good and evil, but they had no life, God's life, all the way from there to Jesus' offer of that life. All people were born dead because of sin. And that God gave the law then to manage and lead dead people, people without the life of God, to Jesus who came that they may have life and have it to the full. That's why he came. And because of that life, the life of God in them, people would become free from the law that had done its job because Christ in us doesn't need any laws or rules to behave himself in us and through us, as we'll see today. This new life, Christ in us, life by the Spirit, is the inheritance of all who are born again of the imperishable seed of God, birthing them out of slavery and into life, out of the flesh and into the spirit that makes us free just as Jesus said he would do. He's done it. And that's us who live by faith in Christ. We've seen that for four chapters of what is only a six-chapter book, Paul has labored to convince believers uh, that they are free from the power of sin, free from death, free from law, free from the lineage of failure and slavery because by grace they've been given the life of God and the freedom that goes and comes with Him for four chapters. We've seen that there are three things that must go together and stay, stay together for the Christian. Three things. Number one, grace. Grace. You and I got everything with God for free by inheritance. We don't have to do anything to get it. We don't have to do anything. We, we, might not, we, don't, we won't do something to lose it. It is in us, in Christ, our inheritance being secured and fully given by Jesus, Christ in you. That's what we have. That's what we got by grace. Everything. Secondly, the life of God. God himself in you. God himself living in you right now. Here's a, here's a question that we'll look at today. What's he doing there? That's what we'll look at. But that's one of the things that we've got to hang on to. And the third one is this, freedom. Freedom. You are liberated to explore God in you and with you throughout your days without fear. Freedom. It's the most important thing he wants you to get in the whole book of Galatians. And if these three do not go together at all times, if Satan can induce you to surrender just one, the power of the new birth will be camouflaged to you. And you'll struggle to live as though you were dead. A torturous existent for a son of God who has life and has been brought to life. They're that important. Grace, the life of God, and freedom. That's the gospel. Our theme verse, maybe you're familiar with this by now, You'll see it on the screen. Let's read it together. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. It is for freedom 
that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Amen? It's a big one. It's a good one. Freedom for you. I think trusting in freedom is our biggest challenge. Would you agree? It's such a big deal. And if you work backward through the three points that we've measured backwards, then you can see why. The question in my mind happens like this. Am I really free to be myself with God no matter what? Is he that comfortable with me? Is God really actually in me? Or is he just around me? Is he drive by God when I get things right? Blessing me with packages and deliveries. Is he really going to go with me into everything? Because he's in me. Good, bad, ugly, beautiful. All of it. And did I and will I, God's son, always get everything by grace? Those are the questions that happen to us. That's how people prey on us and make, help us to make mistakes and induce us to get back to laws and ways that might get favor with God. That's what they did to the Galatians, and that's what they'll do to us as well. Freedom with God is certainly not at the forefront or, or anywhere to be found in any of the religions in this world except Christianity. It's the only one. Our belief, our life with God depends on freedom. Given and freedom walked in. And that's what we'll talk about today. Well, let's get a running start from last week. So let's back up in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. So here's the question. Let me interrupt that. How were they indulging the flesh, that, that part of us that suggests a course for living without the life of God? The only way they could, by entertaining the law and rules for living as they had when they were dead and needed something to keep them alive, they thought. The flesh has an insatiable appetite for the law, for rules as a means of righteousness, but we've seen that the purpose of the law was to lead us to life and righteousness through the gift of Christ. But if we entertain it now, if we start getting entranced with laws and, and rules, we'll get confused. And we know, having been through the first uh, four and a half chapters of Romans, uh, rather Galatians, we know what Paul told the Galatians. That is a disaster. You can't go back. You can't do it. Romans chapter 3, verse 20, it's not on the screen, says this, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our what? Sin. The purpose of the law was not to train you up and make you go right. It's, it was to teach you you can't and to lead you to Jesus who can in you. By the way, let me give you just a little sidebar here. The Galatians weren't doing ugly sins um, like the Corinthians did. They were doing good-looking sins, um, if, there are, if there could be some. Um, they were appeasing God, who, who they thought needed appeasement. They were sort of getting favor with God because they thought they didn't have it, even though he thought they already did. In other words, they were acting like slaves who had nothing, no inheritance, nothing from Father, instead of sons who had, their, who had given them their inheritance in full, the life of God in them. Continuing in verse 13, Paul tells them to rather serve one another humbly. Well, how do we do that? Is it an attitude? No. Just think about how you got what you got. Then you'll have an attitude. How'd you get all this? Uh, I just believed God. He gave it to me. It was his largesse, nothing of mine. That produces a humility because you know you got it by a gift. And love will, become, will come to the forefront because you know you didn't deserve anything, but you've got everything. Ah, love is much better that way. Verse 14, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, 
Watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. In other words, if you guys have arguments about law things, judgment things, those kinds of things, you're going you're gonna to just wipe each other out. Don't do it. Keep thinking about who you are, what you have, who lives in you. And now Paul gives the Galatians and us three of the most important verses I have ever known. These verses do not describe a better way to make life work. They're not a template for success. They're not a formula to get it right finally. They're not a new law that you can go and tout everywhere you go, but a way to know God's grace, to know God in you, life, and to enjoy freedom, the only true freedom on the planet. That's what these three verses give us. So Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, Paul says this, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Can I get a hooray? Yeah, let's do that. That would be great. So, but let me say this, that might upset you, but it's awfully important The goal of the Christian is not to stop sinning, but to start walking by faith in the Spirit of God inside. One more time. The goal of the Christian is not to stop sinning, dang it, but to start walking by faith in the Spirit of God inside. That's it. If we try to stop sinning by works, we'll need the law to tell us what's right and what's wrong, and we'll give the flesh a field day for failure. And we'll be acting as if God does not live in us, like when we were dead and slaves, instead of alive and free, having all things. Paul also writes about this to the uh, the Christians at Colossae. Both that letter and this letter have much of the same truth in them as you would hope and you would figure, both of them uh, by the Spirit of God uh, written by Paul. But the believers in Colossae were growing in belief. They were growing in understanding and experience with God in them while the Galatians were in danger of giving that all up. Paul is happy with the Colossians. You'll see it when you read the book. He just, there's just this love thing going, hey, you got this, 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 and you guys are doing great. But with the Galatians, it's, what are you doing? You're losing all this. You're in danger of losing it. And he is perturbed, to put it mildly. But let's pick it up in Colossians chapter 2, verse 20. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces We saw a couple weeks ago the building block forces or the sequences, these forces that make you live like a slave without God in you, without freedom. Since you've died with Christ to all of that, those things of this world, why as though you still belong to to the world do you submit to its rules? See if you don't recognize these. Verse 21, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Do not handle, do not taste, no touchy. All the time, this is what we get. Don't, 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 don't. That's this world, and that produces slavery. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. They're going to fail. They're going to pass away, and there's no life in them. They're for dead people without the life of Christ. They're not for Christians. Verse 23, such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship. This is a disgusting word, self-imposed worship. It's only used one time. In, the, in all of the New Testament, and it means will worship. Self-worship. Your ability 
worship. I must. I cannot. I better not. I must not. It's will worship if you follow that way. This is the only place where it's used, but it's used in a way to say, don't. This is where slaves are made. Slaves to will worship. Don't go there. So, such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility. Well, I'm doing rather well. Of course, I fail half the time, maybe, maybe not quite that bad. Doing rather well. And their harsh treatment of the body. Anybody know about that? Yeah. I'm not saying you can't ever diet, by the way. I am saying you better do it with God, because if you don't, it'll tear you up on the inside. Why can't I do this? How come I can't? Will worship. That's why. It'll stumble you. Because they lack any value in restraining fleshly indulgence. In other words, they lack any value in in restraining or stopping, literally, fleshly cravings. This is all that the world has. And it's on parade every day. On television, at your workplace, at home, maybe that's the same place. And we're being torn apart by this because it demands laws and rules and works and judgment. And it offers no grace, no life of God, and certainly no freedom. All it has is slavery. You must do this. That's what you must do because you have nothing else except will worship. And let's look at verse 1. Colossians chapter 3. Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Why do you do that? Oh, I'll have a better day. No, it's because that's where you are. You're already seated in heavenly places. You're not going to just arrive there one day and go, what the heck? You're going to arrive there one day and go, yeah, this is what I hoped it would be. This is what I felt like it was. This is what I thought it was like. There'll be a familiarity to you. So, since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, by implication, so are you, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, kind of a big deal, when he appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. We'll get to that. Let's go back to our Galatians passage. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Why not? Because you can't. You can't. This is such good news. As we'll see, if you and I set our mind upon Him, the Holy Spirit who lives in us, then He will see to it that we do not pick up and entertain the law which leads to death because we'll be occupied with Him and life by Him inside. And if you and I are occupied with Him, if we're giving our thoughts to Him, if we're looking to Him, We'll want nothing to do with law which robs us of freedom, camouflages God in us, and makes grace of no effect because we'll be acting and thinking like when we were dead and didn't have the grace of our inheritance, God in us, didn't have God in us, didn't have life in us, and we're not free back then and when we were slaves. And it's a form of torture for you to pick this up. You'll see to it. You're too involved with him to take that. It's one of the greatest things I've ever found. Back in verse 17, For the flesh desires what's contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. Here's the question. What does the flesh want? Seems kind of evident, doesn't it? What does the flesh want? Laws and rules for righteousness that you cannot keep, but which make you a slave instead of a son. That's what the flesh wanted from the day 
Adam and Eve walked out of the Garden of Eden. I got to do something. I got to have rules and laws of performance. I got to do something. What am I going to do? I'm not going to do it very well. However it goes, because I have not life in me, but I got stuff to do. That's what flesh wants. Give me a road map of laws and rules. You'll never keep them. You can't because they make you a slave. You won't want them. You won't like them. So the other question is, what does the Spirit want? If the flesh wants one thing, what does the Spirit want? For you to know God's grace, God's life, and your freedom. That's what he wants. At all times, 24-7, during every occasion, every experience, good, bad, ugly, beautiful, whatever it is, that's what he wants for you. And that's what he'll be working to give you. God's grace, God's life, and your freedom. That's it. Galatians 5, verse 17. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what's contrary to the flesh, they are in conflict with each other so that you are not able to do whatever you please. This word conflict, just to underscore it all, means that they're adversaries. They're against each other. In other words, the law for a Christian produces an adversarial relationship with the Holy Spirit in a Christian. And you're a mess if you don't know that that's true. I remember when I first became, pretty newly became a Christian, and I started reading about the law and all these laws I should keep, and I started thinking, there's nobody keeping this. I can't even keep this. Oh, no, I better study it more. I better know how to do this. And I was a what? A mess. Thank you. I was a mess. Why? They weren't for me. I was alive. I had God living in me. That's what I had. Ah, Christ in me and life by the Spirit. This is the Christian's question, the essence of the Christian's question. Why can't I live the life God wants me to live? Have you ever heard it? Why can't I do this? How come I can't live the life that God wants me to live? Because you were never designed to live it. God alone is life. It's Him. You were never designed to live it. Only He is. They are having the conflict. It's theirs. So let me ask this question. Who is having the conflict? Seems redundant now, doesn't it? They are. The flesh and the spirit. The good news about that is you're actually feeling God in you. When you have inner turmoil, inner conflict, there's there's a fight going on between the flesh, which is not you, because you're new, you're a new creation in Christ, and the spirit who will produce what he's like in and through you. You're actually feeling God. So not every conflict is a bad conflict. It's what you do with that. We'll get to that in just a minute. You're feeling God who's having this fight with the flesh that would make a slave out of you. And you're feeling it. But your goal is not to control it as if it were your problem to fix. Your goal is to choose knowing God and life by what he does in you. That's what we do. If you make inner turmoil resolution your goal, you'll spin off into all kinds of will worship. If I can just read this, if I can just do that and avoid that, if I can just avoid this but do this, then I'll get rid of that inner turmoil. No, you won't. This is for God to do. This is for Him. God in you is the original and ongoing source of grace, life, and freedom, which are never disconnected from Him. Never, ever 
That will never be something you're supposed to run off and do without him. In other words, be your own source of grace, your own source of life, and your own source of freedom. It's not yours to do. He's the one who lives that and produces it in you. Does that make sense? It's never disconnected from him. He's never going to ask you, hey, would you, hey, would you provide some grace for yourself? Would you please provide some of me for yourself, my life? Would you please free yourself? Never going to say it. That's where the flesh is, though. That's what it says. If you would just do this and not do that, we'll worship. Don't do it. And here's the good news. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Oh, is that good news. If you're led by the Spirit, where is the Spirit? Yes, he's, he's, he's all around us. Yes, yes. But where is he happiest to be? That was the plan. He's in us. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. It's not on the screen, but it says this. Through Christ Jesus, the Spirit, the law of the Spirit, the way he always is, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Well, hooray. That's what he does. So you don't have to. Now consider that both the spirit and the law require your attention. Both the spirit and the law or rules for living require your attention. This isn't on the screen, but if you give yourself to the law, you must pay attention to know whether you're keeping it or not, breaking it or not. It involves you. It it, it keeps you involved and engrossed with your what? Behavior. How am I doing? Because actually you're a lawbreaker. It's going to prove that to you, but no, I'm going to not going to break it. Yes, you will. That's all it's good for. It was designed for that. On the other hand, if you give your attention to the Spirit of God in you, life Himself in you, you cannot break anything because that's not a law. That's a life. It's Him. Law and life do not and cannot go together. Only with a life, only with Him in you can you learn to be led and to walk with Him into your day, throughout the day, into whatever it is that happens. Only with Him in you. Laws and rules, you'll break them. But the Holy Spirit in you can't break Him because He's a life and not a law. He's a Him. It's not good grammar, but I think you got it. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. The works, the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred and discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and my favorite three words, and the like. Okay, okay, we get it. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this, find their zoe, their source like this, will not inherit the kingdom of God. They can't. But you believe in Galatians, you've already, have your, you've already got your inheritance. You've already been given your inheritance because you're a son and you're alive. You've got it all. I'm in you. You were once not alive, you Galatians. You were dead, and you were a slave. You'd ne- slaves never have inheritance. They don't get anything. But that's not the case with you, Galatians. You have everything, and you're alive, as Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7 tell us. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. 
By the way, faithfulness does not mean obeying things. It means God is full of faith, and he'll give you some of that. He's full of it, and you can be too because he'll give it to you. Now, let's, let's take a look at this. Wait, a, hang on a minute here. So, we've got a work, a work of the flesh in verse 19, and a fruit of the Spirit in verse 22. A work of the flesh, a fruit of the Spirit. There, there's a difference, right? There's something different there. No one will be righteous by a work of the flesh with a law or a rule motivating it. No one. By the law is the power of sin. We don't have anything to do with that anymore. But this, this, this here in verse 22, this is a fruit or a production of a life. The Spirit, Him now in us. No law and your failure to keep it can stop this. And this is for free. And it's all about your freedom. Do you see it? No law and the breaking of such can stop this, him, in you, him, inside of you. Verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Does anybody want to know how to do that? Well, let's ask the question, what are its passions What are the passions of the flesh and the desires of the flesh? Essentially, it's this. Give me laws. Give me rules. I'll do without life. That's what its cry is. That's what its passion is. That's what its desires are. But Christians are saying no. No to without life. No, I'll not have it. God lives in me, and I'm not going to have that, and neither are you. In other words, I'm keeping the flesh at a distance, nailed up on the cross where I can see it. I may stumble with its struggle and conflict on the inside with the Spirit, but I'm wise to its suggestions. I'm growing wiser to it every day. I know what it's doing. Live by rules, live by laws, and not by God in you. I'm getting wise to that because I've, I'm a son. I'm not a slave. I'm alive. I'm not dead. My inheritance is God himself in me, and he is more than a match for the flesh. That is what you have, and that's what we're learning. Verse 25, since we live by the Spirit, and that's the case for you and for me at all times. You're not going to click into that one day and finally hit it. When you've been taken out of Adam, out of the flesh, and put into the Spirit, where are you? In the Spirit. (laughs) That's where you are. Living by the Spirit is another thing, but in this case, you are always in the Spirit. You just want to be be aware of it. So since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. (sighs) This means... To keep our eyes on him while we, while we take little steps. Just one at a time. In line with him. It literally means in line with him. With our eyes on him. Think of a father coaxing his just starting to walk son or daughter. Come on, you can, you can, you can do this. Come on, you can do this thing. I, I know there'll be some stumbling, but you can do it. You can do this. You can. You could. oh, I know, yeah, that's, that's, that doesn't, okay, I know, yeah. But look, the thing is, we're stepping together. It'll always be the thing. We're stepping together. He's never going to get out and go step on your own, ever. It'll always be, no, we're together in this. You keep your eyes on me just like you did with, with your dad or your mom. Huh, uh, uh. Do that with him. And there'll never be a day of, never a moment of condemnation. Ever. Because it's stepping with him that's the thing. Oh, yeah, I see that stumble. I know, I know. Let's, come on, do it again. Let's go. Here we go. And God will be, in this case, on the inside, earning your trust as he proves himself to you. And then Paul gives us a caution. Verse 26. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. (laughs) 
All three of those, each of those requires law and standards and rules by which to judge righteousness so that there have to be or can be winners and losers, betters and worsers. Okay, they're not words, but that's what happens. If we pick up those rules and standards, that's where we get conceited. That's where we become envious. That's where we, we, we get all messed up in our, our minds. But that is not for us. Now we get to Galatians chapter 6. And it's not the start of a new thought, but a continuation of the same. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, if they're ensnared in something, you who live by the Spirit, go and restore that person gently. Duh. Right? Oh, we know what that's like. That's probably fleshly oriented. Of course it is. And it's law birth. We know what to do. Put you back in your right mind. We'll remind you who you are. We'll, we'll, we'll tell you what, what, where God is living, what he's like with you. And then you'll start giving yourself to him and watch what happens. You'll stand back up again. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. That he's in you. Bear one another's burdens. We can do this. If anyone thinks there's something when they're not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Of course. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps, in other words, he gets a crop, he gets a harvest from what he sows. This is how this works. Whoever sows to please the flesh, from the flesh, will reap destruction. Does that person reap destruction from God? No. That's not what it says. God's not beating you because you've done something bad. Never. The flesh may be, but he's not. The flesh is proving you don't, to you, don't go this way. Live by the Spirit. Live by Him. So, whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. But whoever sows to please the Spirit, where's the Spirit? Inside of us. From the Spirit will reap eternal life. That does not mean life eventually. It means the life of God. Him. We've seen this before. Here's the question then. How do I sow? How do I sow? I pay attention to one or the other, either to the law and the flesh or to the spirit and life. That's how you do it. This is it. Pay attention. Give your attention to one or the other. The word sow means to scatter. It doesn't mean a nice, neat, tight furrow. Ooh, look at that line. That's not what this means. This means, ah, it means to scatter. Some of you have gotten mad at God, and then afterwards you actually ended up feeling better. Why is that? Because God in you knew you were a temporary little lunatic, but you're not actually a lunatic. So because you were even talking at him, even if you were angry at him, he started producing life in you. I'll rescue the temporary lunatic because I know who they are and I'm going to make sure they know they're alive and not a lunatic and they're going to be free again. I'll see to it. I'm not telling you to go chew out God after service. But it's this easy. This light. This experiential. This without fear. That's how good this is. So, if, so give any attention to the Spirit now in you, and He will see to it that you reap life, God's life. That's what He does. We just read about what that looks like in Galatians uh, chapter, chapter 5. We'll get, well, we'll get there in a minute. Actually, we did already, didn't we? Yeah, we did. So we already know what that looks like. It's going to be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. That's how this is going to go. You'll have all of that. So all you do is give your mind to Him, and He produces what He's like in you. And we, re we reap what the Spirit is. Zoe Ionios. Life everlasting. And you have it now. In you. Verse 10. 
actually, sorry, Romans chapter 6, verse 10. We'll go through these pretty quickly. The death Christ died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but what? Does it say to fight sin? No. You died to sin. You're in Christ, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. That would be fleshly. Give me the law, give me, give me rules. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life. Where's God? So where do you make the offering? To the inside. What are you doing? How are you? What are you thinking? I am not liking stuff right now. I don't like my days. I don't like... Those days, that guy, this thing, what are you doing, God? What are you doing? How are you saying? What are you, you turn your, your mind just toward him. And by virtue of where he is, he takes that as his offering, and he then begins to produce life in you. It's that easy. That's why when Jesus said, my burden is easy, my yoke is light, he meant it. Offer yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you're not under law, but yay, grace works. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Skip down to verse 14, Galatians 6, 14. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world was, has been crucified to me and I to the world. This means Galatians, Warrantonians, all who are watching, who are born of the Spirit, you have a whole nother existence. It's nothing like it used to be. When you were a slave, when you were dead, when you were in your sin, now you're not any of those things. You're in life, life is in you, you're free of your sin, and God in you keeps you free. That's what he works toward. If you'll just think about him, give your mind toward him, watch what happens. He produces the life because you can't. This is what he does. This is actually the most active and involved life I have ever known, and I think you will too. This doesn't mean just sitting around, well, you know, grace. That is not what this is. This is incredibly active because you'll be giving your thoughts to God. You'll be thinking about Him any way you can. In the garden, at Warthog Brewing, um, right there, right now, you'll be thinking about Him and turning your thoughts toward Him because you'll see that He is your life and He is all about liberation and grace with you. It's very active, extremely active. It just doesn't look like it because there's no work involved. They're just thinking. That's all there is. If you were looking for the keys to the Christian life, just think about who lives in you. Is that hard? No, it's not. So let me give you some suggestions in closing. Some, just, just some light little suggestions about how to know the Spirit of God in you. How, are, are there some ways? And mostly they're, they're just real simple. Uh, first one is change your prayers. If you've been praying the same way uh, maybe at, at, the, at, the, at the dinner table or same way about a particular problem, um, give me this, give me that, don't let me do that, uh, do this thing. Um, maybe you've got a particular concern or an issue, change it up. Throw a speed bump out in front of your prayer. Don't do it the same way. Start asking questions. Get out of that template and get into the, well, God, what are you thinking? What are you saying? What do you, what do you? And then look for the fruit of the Spirit, His production in you. See how it feels. See what it looks like. See what happens in your mind. See what happens in your, in your thinking. See what happens in, I love this guy. Why did I not? I feel like I want to serve him. I feel like I want to do this thing. I feel like I, I have all this patience. What's, what's happening? life by the Spirit. That's what it is. So change up where the ruts are. If you, if you have a job and you think, well, I can't take this to my job because of the job. Like, like God would have nothing to do on the job. Well, you're right. That's tough. Sheesh, I'm not in there. Mm -mm. No. 
Don't believe that lie. Ask him about certain people on the job or certain situations. Ask, hit your little pause button and talk to God in your mind. Don't do it verbally because people will think you're a weirdo. Um, but think about him. What do you think about this or that? What should I do here or there? Watch what happens in you. Pay attention to the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Pay attention. See what happens. And that will be life by the Spirit because you're alive and he's going to keep you free. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for Paul. What an amazing thing he did. Tortured for it again and again and again. It's so contradictory to this world. It's so much better than this world, but it's so against it. So thank you that you are convincing us about life, about grace, and about you living in us, the hope of glory, Christ in you. That's our hope, him producing what he is like in our day. In Christ's name we pray, amen.